Populated regions offer a particular challenge to networks trying to manage data loads and IoT connections from sensor-rich devices, but what is the best way to densify the 5G wireless network to ensure proper connectivity and content delivery? Here to give us some answers are Todd Sizer, the head of mobile radio research at Nokia Bell Labs, and also next to me is Ken Stewart. He's fellow and chief wireless technologist at Intel, and Ken and Todd, welcome to the segment. Thank Hi, you. thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to start really sort of broad brushing 5G, if you will. Let's talk about the current climate of 5G. Is there a business case, and does the technology exist to support that? And Ken, I'll start with you. All right, so let's take the current climate for 5G. Uh, there is a vast amount of activity around 5G right now. There are trials emerging on a global basis. There are experimental systems emerging globally in China, in Europe, in North America. There are operators emerging who want to sponsor field trials of particular 5G technologies. So in terms of the climate of driven innovation and activity, and innovation activity, at least within Intel, it's extremely high right now. Now, the business case is a separate matter, but in terms of activity, it's of an extraordinary level at the present time. Todd, a business case, and does a technology there to support it? So certainly, I believe there's a business case. Uh, our customers are growing their networks. They're needing more capacity every, every year. And so we need to create new solutions that can meet that capacity need. In addition, we're, we're seeing this shift from the internet being used or the connections being used only for web surfing and video and voice to a more rich set of applications some of which are not well served by today's technologies. And so we want to enable those new solutions, those new services, those new adders to their business case uh, by having new technologies that we can bring to the fore. And yes, there are technologies that we in the labs have been working on the past five or six years that are at the point where I think they're ready for, uh, for standardization and deployment. Ken, there's a lot of talk about air, air interfaces or a different one for 5G. Of course, 3G had a, its own air interface, 4G as well. What can we expect with 5G? So we can expect some, some fundamental changes in the magnitude or scope of the air interface. So when we started 25 years ago, we had GSM. It was a 200 kilohertz carrier bandwidth. Now we'll be looking at 200 megahertz, 400 megahertz, 800 megahertz channel bandwidths. Previously, we'd look at scheduling intervals of maybe uh, 10 milliseconds or even longer. We'll be down to very short scheduling intervals, very rapid reallocation of radio resources between devices. We'll also be looking at key enablers exploiting the air interface. We just talked about full duplex radio, the ability of a radio to transmit and receive inside the same radio resources at the same point in time. That is uh, an extraordinarily enabler for the evolution of the air interface where we can now transmit and receive at the same time on the same spectrum using the same common air interface. So there's a, a really interesting convergence of increased functionality, innovation in the air interface and enablers to give us different ways to think about how the air interface should be designed. Todd, do you think uh, regarding 5G and at this moment that there's no significant change required for the core network? No, there definitely is need for, our ch for, our, for improvements in the core network. Um, for example, low latency, as, as Ken correctly pointed out, is a key new solution that we need to bring to the table. And that in order to get low latency, it's an end-to-end -end latency you need to optimize. and so. Do we need improvements on the air interface and on the radio? Of course. But end to end means through the backhaul, through the metro, through the core, to the content delivery and back. And so we need new types of solutions. We're, we're talking on our booth about connectionless solutions that can allow you to have uh, uh, much shorter times to set up a connection as well as the ability to support millions of connections in a cell at the same time. Ken, I want to go back to you on some of the challenges for 5G. Uh, speed, of course, is something that's been worked on for quite some time. Cell end coverage, extreme low latency, um, capacity for channel capacity. But another uh, challenge that we're talking about now is interference management. Can you tell us why that's a challenge? 
So capacity, capacity in anything but a non-trivial system ultimately is about your ability to manage, suppress and control interference between users and base stations. Accordingly, we think with 5G we have a number of, of very interesting opportunities to explore new ways to control interference. Leaving aside scheduling and other advanced uh, radio resource allocation techniques, interference cancelling radios have come have progressed well over the last 15 years. We see new opportunities to bring very advanced signal processing for interference suppression in 5G. But beyond that, we're talking in 5G about operating at very high frequencies with very um, advanced beamforming techniques that can beam individual user content along very na narrow transmission bandwidths. And that will allow us not only to suppress interference, but to steer the radiation towards users and to suppress its ingress towards other users and base stations. In other words, we anticipate the 5G landscape to be a landscape where we are actively managing through beam steering and beam forming the interference of one system to the next. And this will be a whole new um, vista of interference managed heterogeneous networks. Todd, interference management for a HetNet scenario? Very, it's very important, it's very important. And there's several new technologies coming out. So one that, that we're very excited about at Bell Labs, because we invented the field back a decade, decade ago, is massive MIMO, where you use lots of antennas. And if you phase them correctly, then you follow the model Ken was saying, where you have a very directed beam that can separate energy from other users. But in addition, in areas where you don't have a line of sight connection, and so a directed beam is not the appropriate solution, Massa Nemo can not only steer energy in the right directions, but also steer nulls, steer cancellation, to cancel interference. And so this new flexibility of space, this new flexibility of massive numbers of antennas, we believe is a rich area to explore for interference uh, management. And all cellular systems are interference limited systems, so it's key to the, to the business going forward. Maybe I could add something to, to, to something Todd mentioned. There's two. We're seeing with the advent, especially at Intel, of silicon photonics with baseband signal processing, the ability to cheaply and accurately deploy coordinated radio access networks for the first time. CRANs for the first time. So we have the ability to take from a central unit the ability to map 5G waveforms to remote radio heads and simultaneously control how those remote radio heads are transmitting and receiving from a single centralized node. Now this gives us major new opportunities to schedule over very narrow time intervals, to have radio heads that are transmitting in interfering mode at one instant to collaborate in the next instant to form a beam jointly towards a user. We are creating, therefore, networks that are far more intelligent about how they create interference and manage interference. So we see, therefore, the ability with the advent of new silicon techniques to move into a landscape of managed interference environments which take us from the old cellular concept of frequency reuse and interference management into a much more actively managed interference scenario. It's a very exciting and interesting time to be working in, in communication systems. And this, this solution is one that we saw in LTE with COMP, so our network MIMO is what we called it in the labs, and, and, and that's gotten us a bit of the way here, there. But there were some challenges there, and I think we're going to correct them in 5G to really get get this vision that both Ken and I share of a very dynamic, active interference management network. Right. And uh, centralization, as Ken pointed out, is, is, a, is can play a good part in that too. Of course, there's a number of technologies that support 5G, millimeter wave technology is one of those. Um, Ken, I'll start with you. Why does that seem, always seem to rise to the top of conversations? Well, um, with every generation of wireless technology, we always look for what's sexy and different. <laughs> and as engineers, we're naturally drawn to the, the shiny object in the room. So millimeter wave is very cool. It's very interesting. 
Um, we think it's extremely important. Uh, we're developing technology, and we have technology with YGIG that we will redirect towards 5G bands, such as the 28 gigahertz band or the 39 band. We also think there are very interesting ways to remap that silicon solution to give us the, exactly the kind of massive MIMO arrays that Todd mentioned. They're now realizable in silicon today with rational, low cost, low power consumption manufacturing techniques. Now, at the same time, there are issues with millimeter wave operation, there's penetration loss issues, there's propagation issues. So we're not losing sight of the lower frequency bands too. Things that happen at uh, four gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz and five gigahertz and the much lower frequencies are equally, if I may say, sexy and in many ways very pragmatic. So we see it's the, it's the combination of superb new engineering at millimeter wave for very wide bands, radical new spectrum frontiers in combination with very advanced techniques such as massive MIMO and CRANs at lower frequencies taken in combination is the right way to give us a economic model for 5G that will work. You talked about low band technologies for 5G. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? So I think there's a lot of innovation we need using low band. I mean, people are indoors 80, 90% of the time and we generally serve them from outdoors and so millimeter wave as a technology doesn't have the ability to penetrate mo through most buildings and so there will be a need for new low band technologies as well as for the millimeter wave. So in low band we've been investigating a, a variant of OFDM called universal filtered OFDM. This slight variant allows you to, to have very low latency connections, very different types of solutions uh, solutions that I can describe to you today, like video or broadcast or m machine to machine, but also the flexibility to support applications I can't describe to you today because they haven't been invented yet. And let's, let's not forget that we're designing this solution for 2020, 2025, when there's a whole new generation of folks that have grown up never knowing the old cellular system. They, they expect to be connected at all times and all places. And so they're going to invent new ways of interacting with each other. They're going to demand new things on the, on the radio. So we, we need a very flexible, forward flexible solutions for low band, can enable the applications I can describe to you today, but have the ability in the future to be able to adapt themselves and be flexible enough to support the ones that are going to be invented in the future. And of course, uh, 5G in some regions of the world is expected to launch by 2020, really sort of industry-wide 2025, um, to, be, to be practical. 4G still being deployed. Right. Um, do you think that a 2020 uh, deployment launch date is, is reasonable, is still a, a reasonable conversation to have for 5G? So we still have 2G systems in the world today. We have many, many 2G capable devices. I think most, uh, Almost every device we ship, or chipset we ship from Intel, is a 2G capable chipset. They're also 3G capable, they're effectively five mode device chipsets. Accordingly, it takes a long, long time for earlier technologies to go away. They're not going to disappear anytime soon. So it's, it's good to talk about when the beginnings of technologies happen. So the beginning of 5G in 2020 for, for exactly the kind of focused deployment areas that Todd mentioned, like um, um, transportation centers, stadiums, dense enterprise deployments, uh, dense campuses or urban centers. Absolutely, we think 2020 is absolutely rational. And, and there have been some very interesting announcements about earlier initiatives too, for perhaps more uh, specific use cases but we can imagine seeing very early deployments, even as early as 2019, or possibly before that for some specific use cases. So yes, we see the ramp beginning towards the end of the decade and continuing through 2025 quite powerfully. Todd, do you think 5G will uh, evolve and excel at the same rate that 4G did or at a much, much faster pace? I think it'll be faster. I think it'll be faster, but different, different than previous generations. As Ken correctly pointed out, these wireless technologies that we've deployed in the past, be it 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, they're not going away. 
And so 5G for the first time, our vision is that we build system of systems, that we build solutions that recognize that the end user doesn't care that it's 5G. They don't know, they, don't, they shouldn't have to spell 5G. They shouldn't have to spell Wi-Fi. They shouldn't have to understand Wi-Fi. But it's the job of us to make it so seamless that they have just have a connection and we help them figure out the, the machinations of whether it's, it's 802.11ac or G or LTE or 5G. And so combining the different ways of connecting uh, into a one solution is, is key. But I do believe that there will be need, a need for 5G solutions much earlier. And I agree with Ken, there are use cases that are coming on quickly. The connected car, as well as car to car for accident avoidance, I think it just the connected car, uh, I believe we, we have opportunities that could, will happen very, very quickly. Other, other specific applications, I think some service providers are looking at in more detail, but I expect that we'll see those in the 2018 timeframe. So Nokia and Intel are such important uh, components of the 5G value chain, if I may say that. Um, one uh, on one side of that value chain and, and Nokia on the, on the other. Uh, we appreciate uh, both of you being on our stage today and talking about this and um, giving us a new perspective on 5G and I'm sure we'll be talking about this next year again. Absolutely. So uh, Ken, uh, nice meeting you and Todd, good talking to you again. Thank you so much. Thank very you, appreciate it. And for our continued coverage from the event floor here at Mobile World Congress 2016, please go to tinow.org and follow us on Twitter at TIA underscore now. So long. <laughs>